Hi, I'm Ryan Levy. Welcome to Cyberism's Malicious Life. Criminals, and in particular cyber criminals, aren't good people. They cheat, they steal, they con. But in most cases, they do have their personal boundaries. Someone might be willing to steal millions of dollars from a bank, but not rob an elderly lady. Ross Albrecht, whose story we covered in the previous two episodes of our podcast, was okay with paying a hitman to kill someone, but never murdered anyone himself. But every once in a while, you encounter a criminal who's different. Someone who seems not to have any bounding limits at all. A ruthless man, for whom the goal truly justifies the means. Leo Kovayev is that kind of a person. And it's very probable that it is this no-limits mentality that made him so successful as a cyber criminal. But sometimes, when you have no internal boundaries to balance your raw desire for self-gain, even a genius criminal can go just one step too far. Life in the Soviet Union behind the Iron Curtain was harsh, especially under the rule of Leonid Brezhnev, who revoked all the economic reforms of his predecessor in office and brought the Soviet economy to a standstill. Under Brezhnev, the Communist Party dominated every aspect of the Soviet Union's citizens' lives. But while party leaders enjoyed the benefits of power, most citizens, especially those who lived outside of big cities, lived in pretty miserable conditions. Leonid Leo Alexandrovich Kovayev was born in 1972 in Moscow into this grim economic reality. As a child, he excelled at chess, which became his main hobby. His school teachers praised his extraordinary logical thinking and predicted a bright future for him. But his family's poor financial situation and the pressing need to help his parents and take care of his four sisters prevented him from developing his skills in any way. When the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991 and Russia opened its doors to the world, Leo Kovayev, who was then in his early 20s, discovered a whole new world full of tantalizing opportunities. He was accepted to the prestigious MIT University, specialized in computer engineering, and was especially interested in artificial intelligence. There, too, he showed great potential. A magazine article in a Moscow daily newspaper, published in 2012, described him as, quote, an excellent mathematician, fond of chess, and according to all forecasts, he had a bright future ahead of him as a successful businessman. End quote. But for Leo Kovayev, that wasn't nearly enough. As a man who grew up in the austerity of the communist Soviet Union, Kovayev's encounter with American capitalism was dizzying and intoxicating. It seems that the absolute freedom to do as he pleased dazzled Kovayev, and alongside the projects and classes at MIT, his criminal pursuits began to take shape. We don't know exactly when Kovayev's first get-rich-quick plan was born, but according to estimates, he started distributing pirated movies sometime in the mid-late 90s. At first, it was pirated copies of Disney films and other similar movies, which he copied and sold on the internet. But he quickly noticed the great demand for porn films. His activities began to revolve around adult-only movies, with special emphasis on bestiality porn. Selling pirated porn probably netted Kovayev a pretty sweet income. But again, he wasn't satisfied. 
he used his considerable technical skills to take his questionable business one step further. He attached a small piece of malicious software to the emails he sent to his customers. Once this attachment was opened, it secretly took over the victim's computer and used it to distribute spam. In this way, Kovaev further expanded the marketing efforts of the pirated films he sold. As Kovaev's army of zombie computers grew, he recognized a new opportunity to expand his business and create another income stream for himself. Together with a friend, Kovaev founded a company called 2K Services in Montreal, Canada, and created dozens of online pharmacies where he sold penis enlargement pumps, Viagra, and similar drugs. The spam empire he created helped him reach thousands of new customers, and before long, the business began to turn over millions of dollars. All this time, Kovaev managed to hide his activities from his university colleagues and even graduated with honors. The sale of counterfeit and over-the-counter drugs through websites posing as legitimate pharmacies was a common online crime in the early 2000s, perhaps because many customers preferred the anonymity of the internet over purchasing Viagra at a real-world pharmacy. As time went by and the profits from drug sales grew, Kovaev reduced his involvement in selling pirated movies and focused on selling the drugs that brought him greater profits. As I mentioned earlier, the key to Leo Kovaev's success was his massive use of email spam, spreading millions of emails that contained links to Kovaev's websites. To evade law enforcement authorities, these emails contained many different links, each of which consisted of random letters and numbers combined with familiar brand names such as Viagra and Pfizer to maintain an authentic appearance. These pseudo-gibberish domains were registered in many different countries, from China to Mexico. Clicking on such a link took the visitor to an intermediate server whose role was to redirect the request to Kovaev's actual website. In this way, the fake pharmacy's real address remained hidden from any security software trying to block it. To disguise his sites even more, Kovaev used another technique known as reverse proxy. In this technique, the online store's web server is hosted not on a single server, but on several different ones, and another intermediate server, the aforementioned reverse proxy, relays the web requests to any one of the servers. In this way, the reverse proxy server forms sort of a buffer between the web servers and the visitor, thus hiding the server's identity and true location. Kovaev's sophisticated camouflage methods, for their time anyway, made it very difficult for security researchers trying to determine the extent of his network. But there were other, less direct clues. For example, all of Kovaev's pharmacies included a statement that said that the store operates under the supervision of a regulatory body called the New Zealand Board of Pharmacy. This is a fictitious body, but deliberately similar to the name of a real authority called the Pharmacy Council of New Zealand. The fact that the texts that appear on the websites were written in American English and not New Zealand English is yet another clue pointing in Leo Kovaev's direction. In 2007, an email appeared in the mailboxes of many internet users, with the title, quote, 230 dead as storm batters Europe, end quote. The emails contained a link to an article, but instead of taking the victim to a news piece about the deadly storm, it downloaded and installed a malware that managed to evade Windows security mechanisms and added the infected machine to a growing network of bots. The email's title gave this botnet its name, Storm. 
Windows popularity among computer users meant that the Storm botnet managed to grow incredibly large, roughly 50 million computers, in a relatively short period of time. These computers were used, as before, to distribute email spam. According to estimates, about 6,000 computers were regularly and daily engaged in sending spam, and in September 2007, for example, the average number of spam messages sent by Kovayev's botnet was about 1.2 billion emails per day. According to Spam House, an international organization that monitors the activities of spammers, Kovayev is the second most prolific spammer of all time, and his botnet accounts to no less than 20% of all spam that has ever been distributed in the digital world. This almost unbelievable figure earned Kovayev his informal title, the Tsar of Spammers. In the spirit of the original Storm email, many of these spam emails contain sensational and attractive headlines, which today we would call fake news, such as Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice kicked Chancellor Angelina Merkel and Chinese missile strikes an American aircraft carrier. Other headlines exploited more current news and events, such as the opening of the NFL League or an approaching Christmas. Another technique to get users to click on the links was to promise them free music by popular artists, such as Beyoncé, Rihanna and Kelly Clarkson. At its peak, around 2008, Storm was considered the largest botnet in the world, and according to estimates, was responsible for roughly 8% of all malware installed on Windows computers. Matt Sargent, an anti-spam expert, estimated that, quote, In terms of power, the Storm botnet utterly blows the supercomputers away. If you add up all 500 of the top supercomputers, it blows them all away with just 2 million of its machines. It's very frightening that criminals have access to that much computing power, but there's not much we can do about it. End quote. Peter Gutmann, professor of computer science at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, wrote that, quote, This may be the first time that a top 10 supercomputer has been controlled not by a government or a mega corporation, but by criminals. End quote. The many experts who have examined the Storm botnet estimate that at no point did the system utilize its full power. The reason for this, apparently, is that in addition to his other known activities, marketing of drugs, selling pornographic films and the like, Kovayev used to rent parts of the botnet to other criminals. For example, Storm is believed to have played a key role in the famous DDoS attack that paralyzed Estonia in 2007. In total, according to some estimates, these activities earned Kovayev about $30 million dollars each month. One of the features that set the Storm botnet apart from other botnets at the time was its sophisticated and even groundbreaking defense and attack capabilities. One such sophisticated defensive capability was a technique called Fast Flux, which today is used by many cyber criminals, but Kovayev was the first to use it on a truly massive scale. What is Fast flux. Well, for the sake of explanation, let's say that a robber breaks into a bank and flees the scene in his getaway car. However, before the robber managed to drive away, an eyewitness wrote down the vehicle's license plate number, and now the police are on the lookout for a vehicle with that number. If the search goes on for long enough, it's likely that the vehicle will eventually be spotted and the criminal apprehended. But what if the robber had previously installed in their car a James Bond-style license plate flipper? A gizmo that changes the car's license plate every two minutes or so. That would make spotting the fleeing car much more difficult for the police, no doubt. 
The car license plate, in our analogy, is the IP address of an online pharmacy. Many security companies build themselves databases of blacklisted IP addresses and block them to protect their customers. But as users, we don't usually type an IP address into our browser's address bar. We use a more human-readable domain name, such as malicious.life. The web request for malicious.life gets sent to a DNS server, which translates the domain name back into an IP address, such as, for example, 161.156.161.99. With fast flux, a botnet is able to update the DNS server's entry for a domain name very frequently, even every few minutes, so that the IP address identifying a malicious website is constantly changing, hence the name FastFlux. FastFlux makes tracing the actual physical location of a web server much more difficult. Also, the fact that most of the communication between the bots in the network is peer-to-peer, that is, individual computers who talk amongst themselves, as opposed to all machines talking to a few central servers, also made it very difficult for the researchers to crack open the bot network. But Kovaev, as per his usual self, wasn't content with quote-unquote just passively protecting his botnet. He took it one step further. Storm was also equipped with an automatic attack capability against any entity that tried to investigate or analyze it. Networks from which such probing attempts were made were immediately crippled by massive DDoS attacks. Websites such as SpamHouse, SpamEater.com and 419Eater.com, which monitor the activities of spammers, were attacked and brought down for various periods of time. This ability of Storm led to security professionals being wary of investigating the botnet. Josh Corman, a host protection architect at IBM, said that, quote, As you try to investigate Storm, it knows and it punishes. It fights back. As researchers test their versions of Storm by connecting to Storm command and control servers, the servers seem to recognize these attempts as threatening. Then, either the worm itself or the people behind it seem to knock them off the internet by flooding them with traffic from Storm's botnet, and they're afraid. End quote. It might be that this unusual behavior of actually attacking researchers who try to poke at his infrastructure wasn't the first time that Kovaev crossed lines that most cyber criminals aren't willing to cross. The best strategy for organizations to avoid becoming a victim of ransomware is to prevent the attack from being successful in the first place. Cyber Reason remains undefeated in the fight against ransomware because it moved beyond alerting to deliver an operation-centric approach that detects and prevents ransomware attacks at the earliest stages of initial ingress and lateral movement. The Cyber Reason predictive response capability disrupts ransomware attacks prior to data exfiltration and long before the ransomware payload can be delivered. Visit cyberreason.com to learn more about predictive ransomware protection and how your organization can realize both increased efficiency and efficacy through an operation-centric approach to security operations. Blue Security was a small startup company founded in 2004 by two Israeli entrepreneurs, Eran Reshef and Amir Hirsch, whose goal was to stop email spam. Their idea was to fight fire with fire. For each spam email received by a client, their software sent one email back to the spammer asking for the relevant email address to be removed from their database. It seemed that this unconventional approach to spam prevention actually worked. 
Not only because many of Blue Security's customers reported a sharp decline in the number of spam emails they received, but also because Blue Security quickly became a victim to crippling DDoS attacks launched against its website by a mysterious nemesis known as PharmaMaster. We don't know for sure, but it's likely that PharmaMaster was no other than Leo Kovayev, and if that was him, then what happened next is very much in line with his no-boundaries mentality. According to persistent rumors, Pharma Master sent thugs to threaten in the real world the two founders and their families. Both founders never acknowledged these rumors, but Blue Security was shut down shortly after. It's a story we covered in more depth in episode 3 of Malicious Life, called Spam Empire. Still, there were security researchers who didn't let fear stop them. The first breakthrough in the investigation against Kovayev is credited to Patrick Runeld, head of threat intelligence and detection at Broadcom Incorporated. Patrick noticed that the people behind the botnet have a strong affinity for American culture and language. Further research by Microsoft revealed that the mailing addresses of two of Kovayev's straw companies were in Boston. These discoveries, which linked the criminal activity to an American address, allowed the Attorney General of the state of Massachusetts to convince the court to issue an order allowing law enforcement to take Kovayev's websites offline. In addition, Microsoft's efforts to close the vulnerabilities his malware exploited in Windows resulted in a reduction of about 20% in the number of computers connected to the botnet. These efforts, along with strong competition from other bot networks that led to a price war in the underworld, meant that Storm's dominance began to fade by 2009. Leo Kovayev himself managed to escape from the United States at the last minute and return to Russia with his wife and two children. He stood trial in the United States in absentia and was found guilty of distributing spam and pornography, selling drugs and a host of other federal offenses, for which he was fined $37.5 million. But since there's no extradition treaty between the US and Russia, and also thanks to his connections in the Russian government, Kovayev continued to run his schemes and scams from Russia without interruption. One such scam is known as a pump-and-dump scam. Kovayev purchased many cheap shares of mostly unknown companies and then distributed millions of spam messages with alleged inside information that claimed the aforementioned shares were going to soar in the near future. Victims who fell for Kovayev's scam bought these shares, and the sudden increase in demand naturally caused these share prices to skyrocket. Right then, Kovayev would sell the shares in his possession at the new higher price, making a huge profit. The sell would lessen the demand for the shares, which would then crash back to their true market values, causing the gullible investors to lose all or most of their investment. Leo Kovayev left Moscow as a pauper and returned to it as a very wealthy man. He began to invest in real estate projects throughout Russia, purchasing land in St. Petersburg and establishing a chain of successful cafes and grill restaurants. He led an extravagant lifestyle, while at the same time continuing his cybercrime activities, including, for example, renting parts of his botnet to other elements of the Russian underworld. These renters would use Kovayev's botnet to host fake pharmacies or other such shops, and in return, pay a percentage of each sale to Kovayev himself. During this time, Kovayev committed several minor offenses that got him into trouble with the Russian law enforcement authorities, 
But despite the pressure on the Russian government by the U.S. to extradite him, Kovayev had enough allies in Russia to make sure that any police investigation opened against him was terminated almost as quickly as it opened. Reports in the Russian media show that on several occasions, Kovayev was under surveillance by the secret police, but continued to operate undisturbed. It seemed like Kovayev's personal philosophy of no boundaries was definitely paying off. He was rich, he was a major player in the Russian underground, and he was safe from his American prosecutors. But it was then that Leo Kovayev made a critical mistake. As part of his flamboyant lifestyle, Kovayev turned one of his office basements into a sex dungeon that was fully equipped with sex toys, a shower, a sauna, a jacuzzi, whips, handcuffs, and a huge bed. He hired prostitutes to join him every night, making sure that they always weighed less than 80 pounds, or 35 kilograms. But at some point, this just wasn't enough for him, and so Kovayev started looking for alternatives to satisfy his insatiable sexual appetite. One day, he met a 12-year-old girl who lived in a boarding school not far from one of his offices. Kovayev learned that the girl is suffering from mental issues, but is too poor to afford the medication she needs. He seized the opportunity, convinced the girl to sleep with him, and when he was done, gave her some thousand rubles. He even offered her another 500 rubles for every girl she will bring to him in the future. A short time later, he found a new accomplice named Olga Chernokozova, who helped him find no less than 12 other young girls. Many of his victims suffered from mental problems. The oldest was only 16 years old. When his deeds were discovered, the Russian police started investigating the matter, but Kovayev employed as many tricks as he could to delay that investigation. For example, he pretended not to remember anything, then tried to blame the young girls who supposedly seduced him, and finally even managed to convince the court that he was schizophrenic and mentally unfit to stand trial. Kovayev was transferred to a psychiatric hospital, but according to reports, his stay there was quite comfortable, and he even continued to invite prostitutes and even little girls to his room. In the end, the police investigators were able to convince the court to order another medical evaluation for Kovayev, and he was ultimately sentenced to 20 years in a correctional facility that is considered particularly harsh, even by Russian standards. To evade this severe punishment, Kovayev promised to compensate his victims for 5,000 rubles each, plus another 5 million rubles that he would quote-unquote donate to the court. We don't know if these suggestions did the job, but we do know that in 2012, the Russian Supreme Court shortened Kovayev's prison term to only 10 years, and he was transferred to a more relaxed correctional facility. During his time in prison, Kovayev studied previous pedophilia cases in Russia, and then returned to the court with a new and rather surprising demand. Castrate me chemically, and shorten my sentence to only seven years. Some time later, Kovayev withdrew his request, but at the same time filed a complaint to the court about the quote-unquote humiliating treatment he was subject to in prison. In total, Kovayev submitted over 250 such complaints to the court and the Russian prison service, and everyone who was involved in his case was also personally sued by Kovayev. According to reports, he mocked his jailers and fellow prisoners, and even masturbated using pictures of his cellmates and their families. This behavior, together with the well-known fact that child molesters are usually treated as scum by other inmates, got him into fights that almost cost him his life. 
Due to his troublesome behavior, he was constantly moved between different prisons in the country. As of this writing, Kovaev is due to be released from prison at any moment, or may even have already been released. The Russian media rarely reports on his exploits, so it's difficult for us in the West to track his actions. Will he go back to his antics and flood our mailboxes with spam and nasty scams? Who knows, but it is doubtful that his stay in prison dulled his sharp business and technological acumen, nor his personal conviction that the goal always justifies the means, however twisted and unconventional. In that case, it's almost certain that Leo Kovaev remains one of the most dangerous criminals out there. That's it for this episode. I'll keep this outro a bit short because I've got a plane to catch. I missed DEF CON and Black Hat this year, and I'll be attending Podcast Movement in Dallas later this month. So if any of you happen to be in Podcast Movement, ping me via the conferences app and say hello. Malicious Life is produced by PI Media. This episode was produced by Itai Hasid, edited by Nate Nilsson, with sound design by Yotam Halachmi. Hadas Drucker does our social media. Our website is malicious.life, where you can find all of our past episodes and full transcripts. And you can follow us on Twitter at, at maliciouslife or me at, at ranlevi. That's R-A-N-L-E-V-I. Thanks to Cyber Reason for underwriting the podcast. Learn more at cyberreason.com. Bye-bye. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god.